we come to our last speaker, Professor Gerald Nelson. From the, um, he's currently serving as a member of the World Economic Forum, and uh, he has been. Uh, he's retired now, but but he's he's still very very active. He has been driving some of the policy development, policy analysis, and development for the CGIAR system that, that you have already heard about, but also um, advising um, important foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, he has many other activities, but in the interest of time, I want to keep this short and uh, give him the floor to discuss one more aspect that we have already touched upon, but that he will take a much more critical look at, and that is food security and the changing climate. I think that is a good topic for the end. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for a very wonderful conference and the opportunity to give, you a, f give a few remarks on the very important topic of food security and climate change. I'm the last speaker, sometimes referred to as the last but not least. Maybe that's not the greatest. Another one is we save the best for last. That's another w way to think about the last speaker. I would say that I'm perhaps the most depressing speaker, and you'll see why in a few minutes. Um, the food security challenges facing the world are unprecedented for the human species. We've heard much remarks about various aspects of them, so let me just give a quick overview. We're going to have many more people on the world. Between now and 2050, we'll proceed from roughly 7 billion today to 9 or more billion by that period of time. A 50% increase, not evenly distributed, but concentrated in what we call today the developing countries. Those people will almost certainly have higher incomes. And because they have higher incomes, they can effectively demand more food and higher quality food. This will result in an increasing situation of what's been referred to as the double burden of malnutrition. We still have too many people going to bed hungry every night. But in addition to that, we have a growing population of people who are obese. The country to the south of mine, Mexico, has the uh, uh, unfortunate claim to fame of now surpassing the U.S. in terms of the share of population that's uh, obese and overweight. And many other places around the world, we have a similar situation where on one place, one hand we have poor, hungry people, and on the other side we have people that weigh too much and so suffer the health consequences of that. We see a growing stress on the natural resources used to provide that food that we eat and that we need going forward. Whether we're talking about water quantity and water quality, the soil uh, health that um, uh, Mr. Tupfer spoke about recently, clean air, biodiversity, all subjects that have been touched on in the last uh, two days. Uh, these are resource scarcities are becoming increasingly serious in all parts of the world. Um, we add to this set of challenges facing us the challenge of climate change. And it's what the military calls a threat multiplier. It takes all of the problems that you already have and makes them potentially much worse. I mention the military explicitly because the military in the US has recently released a report focusing on the threats of climate change to the security of the United States. And I'm sure that the similar activities have been going on in pretty much every country of the world. This is a very serious problem. So let me talk first of all about what is climate change. I think it's useful to review just briefly what we mean by the term climate change. So climate itself is the average of weather over an extended period. So a typical period that we talk about when we talk about climate change is 30 years. And climate change then is the change in the averages of those weather variables. What weather variables are we interested in um, that are important for agriculture? Here's some examples. Temperature, obviously, we're going to see higher temperatures, daily averages, but also for agriculture, minimum temperatures and maximum temperatures on every day are potentially important for productivity. Rainfall, we don't have plants without rain, and so the distribution of rainfall and the quantity of rainfall are variables that are, we need to look at when we think about climate change. Growing degree days is a calculated variable, which is important for looking at how fast plants mature and what the consequences of 
that rapid maturity is for yields and for <laughs> nutritional characteristics as well. And there are particular periods in the life of a plant when particular temperature and or precipitation outcomes are very important for productivity. So August is a time in the northern hemisphere when many crops mature and flower, and if you happen to have dry, hot conditions, it reduces productivity in a particularly narrow window. So these are the kinds of weather variables that we need to look at as we go forward in time. It's not always been the case, by the way, that the climate community has provided those variables to us. Another case where a dialogue between one discipline and another discipline is badly needed. Now, I moved about two years ago to a part of the United States uh, in western Colorado where we have very limited rainfall, nine inches of rain a year. It's pretty dry. 300 days of sunshine a year, pretty sunny, and 5,000 feet of elevation. So this graph gives you the relationship of weather to climate for a particular variable of importance to agriculture. This is the maximum temperature in the month of August from 2000 to the present, roughly speaking. The light blue bars are the variability in that maximum temperature over that period of time. And as you can see, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. Um, the, the darker black line is a moving average of that, and then the heavy black straight line is just a, 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 a correlation between temperature and time. And what you can see is that over that period of time in Grand Junction, the temperature, average temperature, maximum temperature in August has increased by about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now that's in one part of the United States. Here's a different part of the United States. This is in St. Louis, Missouri, in the southern part of the Corn Belt, a very important part of the agricultural um, powerhouse of the United States. Um, and what you can see is at least for this period, which ends actually in mid-1960s, there has been no change in the August maximum. So the point I want to bring home from these two slides is that like agriculture, climate is a location-specific um, variable that we need to understand. And so looking at global averages, which is unfortunately what we do, can tend to obscure some very important differences around the world. But here's some global averages. So this is what the IPCC has told us about what the history has been. You can see that over the period from the late 1800s, well, the mid 1800s until the beginning of the 21st century, we've had an increase of, of about one degree C. This is a global average over a whole bunch of the planet, let's say all of the planet. Here's what the changes look like uh, in a slightly different time period, 1901 to 2012. So you can see that that average hides different changes. As a very rough rule, the extremes, whether we're talking about the north and south or we're talking about higher elevations, have tended to see greater changes in temperature than the mid-latitudes and, um, and the lower areas. Um, now, let's talk now about what has caused this. At least in my part of the world, we still have a fairly substantial influence from the climate deniers. Let's talk a little bit about the science. We start with sunlight falling on the surface. Without the sunlight, we would have a very cold planet. And we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that already exists because without the greenhouse gases, we'd still have a very cold planet even with the atmosphere. So then the existence of the greenhouse gases, in particular moisture, creates clouds that can reflect the sunlight to get some cooling. And then we add dust particles to that caused by the patterns of the wind blowing stuff into the air that can either give you temperature increases or temperature or cooling depending upon their location. Um, some other factors. What are the most important greenhouse gases? You'll find this list is a little different than the one you typically see because it starts with water vapor. Water vapor is an extremely important greenhouse gas, raising the average temperature on the planet up to about, don't quote me on this, but about 60, 50, deg six, 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius. That's five or 10 if I'm doing my math right in the head. And we get that from evaporation from water bodies. Now what you're more likely to have seen is the next list, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And carbon dioxide is the big elephant in the climate change room. Um, we do calculations of the effects of other greenhouse gases relative to the effects of carbon dioxide. So methane is about 20 
to 30% more potent in terms of capturing the sun's radiation than carbon dioxide uh, on an 80-year to 100-year basis. Nitrogen, nitrous oxide is, is um, about 130 times greater than carbon dioxide. But these latter gases disappear relatively quickly, certainly in terms of geo geologic time, than does carbon dioxide, which once released into the atmosphere by burning or other sources, tends to stay there for, for thousands of years, as opposed to 10 to hundreds of years. Now, there are natural sources for all of these things and anthropogenic sources, and I've listed some. The red sources are the natural ones, and the black sources are the um, anthropogenic. And so the question is, well, climates have changed in the past. Isn't what we're seeing just kind of natural stuff going on? If you add to this mix the changes in the orbit of the planet, maybe all the observed warming that we've seen comes from those natural things, and you know we don't have to worry about climate change, at least changing our economic system to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, which will, there will be some cost associated with. So let's look at the pattern of greenhouse gas emissions. Here's CO2. As I said, the big elephant in the room, and it's starting from 1960 to around 2012, we've seen an increase of 320 parts per million to roughly 400 parts per million. Now, I'm an economist, not a climate scientist. Most of the people in the room have not looked at this history, but this is an unprecedented increase in the carbon dioxide concentrations. We're now at a level that we have not seen at least in a million years. Now, for those of you who are a little vague on your human evolution history, there weren't many humans of the kind that we are in a million years ago. In fact, that was well before Homo sapiens evolved. And that applies to the rest of the plants and animals that we rely on today. So we have evolved in a relatively, from a geologic time, low carbon dioxide concentration world. And we're now heading into a world that has much higher carbon dioxide concentrations. And those carbon dioxide emissions, or concentrations have come from our use, for the most part, of fossil fuels in this extremely short, from a geologic perspective, time change. And unfortunately, the rate of emissions has been growing rather than slowing down. We all know the sources of why this has been happening. So carbon dioxide, rapid growth. What about the other greenhouse gases? Similar sorts of stories. Nitrous oxide has been going up rapidly. Methane has been going up, slowed for a little while, now has started increasing again. Why? Well, the slowing might have been due to the fact that the Russians discovered that all that gas they were shipping to Europe was going through pipelines that had a lot of leaks. So they tightened up the pipes and the leaks were reduced. And so we, for a while, we had a slowdown in methane emissions. But it started up again, possibly due to fracking, which started in my backyard, so to speak, about 10 or 15 years ago. And um, unfortunately, the leaks from that can offset the effectiveness of, carbon, of uh, methane, natural gas, in terms of its um, energy, its, its global warming potential relative to coal. So leak control is an extremely important thing that needs to happen when you're doing fracking. Now, if you look then at the mix of sources of greenhouse gases, what you see is that actually agriculture is a relatively important contributor, both directly from methane emissions from, from um, the front end of cows or from irrigated rice with that anorganic decomposition, um, and nitrous oxide from the use of organic and inorganic fertilizers, but also indirectly from deforestation, cutting down forests, releasing that CO2 into the air as we grow crops and do pasture. And the emissions of CO2 and CO2 are likely to rise much more rapidly Everybody has seen this, the pictures of the pollution in the Chinese cities, driven at least in part by the extremely rapid use of coal for energy um, in a very rapidly growing economy. Similar sorts of stories for India in particular. Those two countries, um, it, China has surpassed the United States as a country in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Per capita, it's still much less than the US. Uh, but it will continue to grow for the foreseeable future. Now, um, I showed you earlier a graph about how temperatures have been increasing. Here it is again. This graph looks at the uh, average temperature over the period from 1880 to uh, 2010. I put in these two blue bars here to indicate a range 
that I'm going to show you again in the next picture looking forward in time. So there's the two blue bars again, and the gray area is what's happened historically now in terms of temperature increases. And then this is what the latest IPCC report might happen going forward to 2100. This blue bar here with the black line being the mean of several climate model results is a world in which we keep the emissions down so that the radiative forcing is at the level 2.6. Let me just say in a casual way that that's just totally impossible to happen. Um, and then the red bar is a radiative forcing of, uh, of 8.5 watts per square meter by 2100. Again, the red line in the middle is the average of several model results. Unfortunately, in terms of emissions, we're following the red pathway today rather than the blue pathway or anything in between. So if you take that red pathway and you look at going forward, we could get as high as mm, five and a half degrees C temperature increase uh, between 2000 and, and 20. 100, um, that would make agriculture very difficult in many places in the world. Now, more greenhouse gases means more temperature, means more evaporation, and then the question is, where does it come down? So what's going to happen to precipitation? The climate models are much less consistent in their estimation of where precipitation patterns will happen than they are about the temperature increases. So let me show you two different results. These are just from two different climate models, actually from the last uh, IPCC assessment. This is from a model. They all, both of these two pictures use the same greenhouse gas emission pathways, but they have very different outcomes on the distribution of precipitation. So this is an Australian model. Focus in on your favorite part of the world. I mean, look at the Corn Belt, because I used to live in the Corn Belt. And what you see is that uh, some increase in precipitation, a little green, some decrease in precipitation, not a lot of change between 2000 and 2050. Over here in Bangladesh, similar sorts of stories. You know, Brazil, a little bit greener in the Amazon. Now here's a different model, the Miruk model is a uh, Japanese model, again, the same emissions pathways, uh, but very different outcomes in precipitation. So again, to use a technical term, the Corn Belt gets hammered. It dries out along with higher temperatures that come along. In a different way, Bangladesh gets hammered with even more rain than it currently has. And we'll come back and see what effect that difference in precipitation patterns along with temperature has on agriculture, a couple different agriculture things. I throw this picture in here just to show you that even if you just look at temperature, you can see that the models give you different results spatially month by month. And of course, that matters. A cold snap in a particular time of the year in the springtime can be devastating, even if your average temperatures have gone up. And in my part of the world where we grow 80% of the Colorado wine, which I realize is not a large share of the world's wine industry, we, get, we had a terrible long cold snap this springtime and wiped out much of the wine production as a result. Um, now, sometimes we say climate change is going to happen, it's going to be a problem. In fact, we can argue, I think, quite convincingly now that climate change has already affected agriculture. A few statistics, the Chinese rice production has shifted north into Heilongjiang province um, and a little bit less and moved out of the south, not, not completely out of the south, but there have been regional changes in a northward direction in China. China, by the way, is one of the few countries that seems to do relatively well, at least in part because it's got this large landmass to the north with reasonably good soil characteristics. Coffee production has been shifting up the mountains, um, and there is concern that we'll run out of mountains to grow coffee in. Um, the, 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 there's a figure that's missing here. It's a, from a Newsweek article about how it's the end of pasta is the name of the article. Um, it was written by an author who originally pitched it to an Italian uh, publication, and the Italian publication said, this is way too scary. We can't talk about the end of pasta in Italy. You publish it in the U.S., and then we'll refer to it in our, in our, uh, in our publication. Uh, let me talk about some research by David Lobel, a, a, a prominent 
young rising star in the, uh, in the climate change and agriculture field. So you might be aware that in the US, the agriculture community has not been, shall we say, a really strong advocate of doing something about climate change. And this perhaps tells the reason why. So this figure looks at, there are trends from the effects of the research done by Syngenta and Monsanto in terms of agricultural growth. They've been slowing, but they still grow. And so what David did and his colleagues did was to say, let's take a look at these trends, what they would have been without climate change, and then let's factor in a climate change depressing effect. So look over here at the top um, left at, here we go, at maize, or at the top right at wheat, or in the bottom right at soy. And what you see is that these gray bars to the right indicate the depressing effects of climate change on that yield trend. And for those hugely important crops, at least in the US, there's been very little negative effect from climate change. We've got lucky in the US in terms of the nature of climate change that's happened. There has been some, but the adaptations have been relatively easy. I'm happy to talk about what those are later. Um, but the question is, well, will this actually continue or not? And the answer is almost certainly no. The, the critical question is, when do those relatively favorable changes become outweighed. And the effects of these that we've seen in the past are with relatively small changes in temperature and precipitation, we can expect greater ones. So here's some results that take the MIROC um, climate model with the RCP 8.5, that's the most extreme, but at the moment, the most likely of the climate change concentration pathways. And, and it looks at what the effects are on rain-fed corn yield between 2000 and 2050. And it does the same thing with this GFDI model. Now, if you just focus in on the corn belt, what you can see is with the GFDI model, we get some yield declines. The yellow is a less than 25%. The red is a 25 to 50% yield decline. Um, and then the blues are actually increases in yield. What you can see in the corn belt is that with GFDI you get some decline, zero to 25%, but with the MIROC model you get large areas with a 50% decline, a 25 to 50% decline in yields, and that's between now and 2050. And a similar story over here with rice. This is irrigated rice, so you don't have the issue of water scarcity in this modeling exercise because we assume that there's enough, model in an uh, enough water in an irrigation system, but you still get heat effects. And you can see that there are some yellow areas with some yield declines, some of it's more serious than others, but a few places where actually irrigated rice might have higher yields. If it's on the low end of the temperature regime for the crop now, warming it up will actually be good. But this assumes, of course, that there is enough water in the irrigation systems. And one of the things that climate change is likely to do is to change the distribution of the precipitation patterns and therefore the amount available for irrigation. The Colorado River runs by my house about two and a half miles away. 70% of the water that goes into Lake Mead goes by my house. And between now and 20, 50, the models are varied about the amount of precipitation, but if you take the average amount of precipitation that falls basically in the Rockies, which is where all of that water comes from, and you factor in the expected increase in evapotranspiration, there's going to be 10% less water going by my house in the Colorado River. Now, if any of you have ever been to the, the Central Valley, at the Southern Valley, the Imperial Valley in Colorado, or Phoenix, or Tucson, well, you've been drinking that water that's been going by my house, or eating plants grown from it and it's gonna cause really serious issues in the southwest of the United States about who gets that water. Now, I've talked about the 2050, which is for the most part the, the period of time that this analysis that I've done covers. But here, let's just look going forward in time to 2080. So we're just gonna look at developing countries, irrigated wheat, so we're not even worried right now about shortages of water. The effects are relatively small by between 2000 and 2030, they get somewhat larger by 2050, but then they jump up dramatically um, by 2080. And if I go back just for a minute, if I can, to this, what you can see is that by 2050, the model results here, climate model results don't differ a lot, but when you get out to 2100, they differ dramatically in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's extremely important 
that we slow those, start slowing those emissions today. And unfortunately, as you all know, we're actually not doing a very good job in doing that. Um, in the late 2010, colleagues and I published uh, this report, and I want to give you uh, some of the key findings from it. Because what I have been talking about most recently in this presentation is just climate change. But remember, we have other problems facing us in the food security world. So uh, some key findings. The first one is that agricultural prices increase. I'll tell you in a minute why this is such a key finding. Um, and income and population growth are really important drivers of that. But they increase even more because of climate change. And it means that we need to have international trade to deal with the effects of climate change. So let me first walk you through some numbers here. This is the history of agricultural prices in the 20th century. And by the way, on a, on a positive note, we, our success as a species, an indication of the success of our species for all the problems that we have today, is that in 2000, in 1900, if you were born in 1900, your life expectancy was likely to be 40 years or less. And we had about one and a half to two billion people, one and a half billion people on the planet. By the year 2000, life expectancy is well over 60 for most parts of the world. And we have now seven billion people. So we have been singularly successful as a species in expanding our numbers and improving our likelihood. And the question is whether we can continue that going forward. Anyway. Agricultural prices between the beginning of the last century and the end of the last century declined uh, quite dramatically with some ups and downs. Um, and in some ways, that's, that sowed the seeds of the current problems that we're having with agricultural productivity. I won't go into that right now, but we could talk about that in the discussion section. What I want to talk about then is our modeling looking forward to 2050. So we combine the consequences of higher income, more people with climate change. What you're seeing here are the results for the key uh, agricultural commodities, price increases between 2010 and 2050, focusing just on a sort of a run of the mill, middle of the road scenario. And we've got good cases and bad cases, which I can give you later, um, of price increases. So what you see is that Population and income in this middle of the road scenario gives you a 50 to 55% increase in prices. Complete turnaround from the history of the 20, 20th century. Add climate change to that story and it gets much more dramatic. Now, uh, I'll give you some caveats on that in a minute, but look now at the trade results. Let's just focus on the CSIRO um, and the Miroc results over here on the right-hand side for the optimistic scenario. If we could somehow stop all climate change today, international trade from the developed countries and cereals would be about what it is uh, today and it would be the same in 2050. If the Corn Belt gets blasted by climate change, we have a big decline in exports from the developing, developed countries. If we have the CSRO, much smaller declines in exports. But the point to make here is that we will have more variability not modeled. These dramatic changes in uh, trade flows are a result of mean changes, and variability will accentuate the cost and the need to adapt to, uh, to climate change by shipping goods from one part of the world. And so the recent presentation on the bad news about the WTO is not a good sign for our ability to adapt to climate change. Uh, this is a complicated graph, but one that gets at, to, in some sense, the heart of human well-being issues with respect to climate change, income, and population growth. This is the period between 2010 and 2050. This is an optimistic scenario where we have slower population growth and higher income growth. This is a pessimistic scenario with the opposite. The dotted lines here are the kilocalorie availability per capita per day. And you can see that we, for the rich countries of the world, the area at the top, the dotted line starts at 3,300 or so kilocalories a day, one of the reasons why we have a growing obesity problem in the rich countries, and goes up somewhat. Maybe that's a not so optimistic scenario. Um, 
But if you look at the low-income countries, they start at 1,800 kilocalories per day, but increase dramatically with, um, over time in this optimistic scenario. Why? Because population growth slows and income growth is more rapid. What does climate change do? Climate change shifts the results from the dotted red line down to these solid lines. The actual climate change model used measures much less than whether you have climate change or you don't have climate change. Now, let's look just over here at the pessimistic side at the low-income countries. What you see is in a pessimistic world, kilocalorie availability remains the same with no climate change or goes down as it does everywhere with respect to climate change. In this depressing scenario, we end up with calorie availability on average for the 25 poorest countries of the world of less than 2,000. This is a starvation scenario and one that I sincerely hope doesn't happen, but we're unfortunately on a path to it actually happening. Um, a little bit of qualification. We're not the only ones at IFRI who do this kind of modeling. Some countries tell a, some models tell a completely different story of prices going up between now and 2050 and prices going down. This is the worst of the economists on the one hand, on the other hand story. And this is a result of really rapid expansion in deforestation, so we cut down trees to grow more crops. And this doesn't happen in these countries, in these models that have higher prices. So assumptions about what happens tell us also where we need to put policy actions in place. Um, the models themselves are much more consistent about their effects of climate change. Starting over here, what we have is the biophysical productivity effects of climate change across all the crops that we model, with an average here in the middle of about 17%. Adaptation as modeled in the various models included in this exercise reduce that mean yield to 11%. And what we see in compensation then is a big increase in the area devoted to crops, depending upon the model and the crop, but on average about a 11% a, um, increase in area. Sorry, these numbers are not aligned properly in this particular figure. The, the bottom line messages that came out of our 2000 study are, are these. If you're concerned about food security and sustainable development, what you should do today is not to focus on climate change actions today. There are many, many things you can do today that need to be done to deal with the food security challenges that countries face today, involving government policies, infrastructure investments, and those sorts of things. But at the same time, you need to begin the process of preparing today for the inevitable climate change that we're going to face. Higher temperatures mean we need to invest in more capacity, human and physical, to adapt agriculture, keep international trade relatively free from barriers, and use domestic policies to improve agricultural productivity and resilience, importantly. And I have to say that the data on which we make these kinds of analyses is extremely limited. I will say there are more guesstimates than there are solid numbers than we would like to see in this kind of analysis. So we always should be thinking about ways to improve the information base on which we make this kind of analysis. But um, let me end by talking about why this is a, the most depressing talk of the week. And it's what I call the lamppost problem. The lamppost, there's a little figure missing in this diagram, but it shows somebody underneath the lamppost looking for his car keys, which he dropped over by his car in the dark. Why are you looking there? Because the light is brightest. That, in some sense, describes the modeling situation we have as we try to look forward in time to the effects of climate change and the potential for policy and program reform. Now, the models don't include many negative effects of climate change. Ozone levels will, will increase, which is bad for human health, animal health, and plant health. We will increase extreme events, and extreme events effects are not captured in any of these models. Increasing temperature and precipitation humidity will increase pest and disease pressures, and it will also affect the nutritional content 
of the crops that we grow. These effects could swamp the already negative story that I have told um, and make the challenges much more difficult even over the 35 years to 2050, after which the challenges become really extreme. So on that depressing note, here's some additional information. Place you could go for additional information. This will also be available on the website. And I thank you for your attention.